Hey everyone, welcome back to Dev Parkour. In this video, I want to talk about why writing parsers is so hard. Uh, so, in case you missed it, yesterday's video was all about writing parsers in Rust uh, using the, the crate called NOM, N-O-M. Um, and I actually think NOM made writing parsers uh, a lot easier. Uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, I, I've, I've written a few parsers over the years. Uh, sometimes with, with various libraries um, that uh, try to make uh, writing parsers easier. Um, and, and some, you know, they, they provide different, different functionality. Um, so in, this, in the C world, you have things like uh, Lex and Bison, Yak, uh, depending on what, it's, you know, what variant you're using. Um, they're kind of like the gold standard but fairly archaic. Uh, compiler design, uh, compiler science, parser science has, has, has advanced in the last 20, 30 years uh, significantly. And there are actually techniques that, that make things uh, much better. And some of the things that we can take advantage of with like parallel computation and stuff like that, um, that enable better parsers. So uh, more recently, I've used something called a parser expression grammar uh, there's a good library for C Sharp called Pegasus that makes writing parsers pretty easy. Um, and then obviously uh, NOM has, a, has, a, has a, a still yet different style. Um, but when it comes down to it, parsers are, are, are difficult for, I mean, probably multiple reasons, but I'm going to highlight two specifically in this video. And the first one is that uh, computers are very precise. Uh, it's really important when you're writing a parser to first have the language established. So in my case, for this this video series, or uh, for this, this project in Rust, I'm building a parser for the SQL language. Um, thankfully, SQL is very well defined. And for the most part, there's essentially one way to express each thought in the SQL language. Uh, that's not the case with many programming languages. C Sharp, for instance, um, you can express things in terms of for loops, you can express things in terms of link queries, um, and in some cases there are multiple ways to express essentially the same concept. Um, and there's some kind of assumed context that gets provided every single bit of assumed context makes the parser more complex. Uh, the more a language looks and feels like English, the more complex the parser is going to be. Because uh, English or any language, any spoken language, spoken languages in human interaction is extremely context driven. We can very easily talk about things that we referred to several sentences back. And when we're talking to people, we kind of innately know what we're talking about. We know what's being referred to. Computers don't have that. Computers don't have that ability to determine context, you know, by process of elimination or by understanding, you know, previous examples. They, that gets into the whole topic of machine learning, and that's not the way compilers work. Not saying you couldn't build a compiler that's built on, on top of machine learning, but the whole premise behind compilers is that a given input produces one and only one output. It's deterministic. Otherwise, computer programming would just be the Wild West. So that's, that's one thing, is that in order to build a parser, the input language needs to be very clearly defined. And sometimes that presents challenges when you go to describe it in terms of some sort of parsing grammar, whether it be a parser expression grammar or uh, a context-free grammar, regular grammar, you know, whatever. Um, there's a challenge in trying to express the language that you understand and the language that you might be able to communicate with, with another developer and expressing that in terms that the computer can turn into a deterministic output. The second thing 
that is challenging when it comes to um, parsers is, oh geez, it was right there. I had two things that I was going to talk about. Well, hold that thought. There's at least one. Aha, I remembered. Okay, so the second thing that makes parsers hard is in defining your AST, your abstract syntax tree. Um, now, in very simple parser examples, uh, sometimes you'll see uh, code that kind of glosses over the abstract syntax tree concept and just runs through parsing the input and immediately spits out the output. That helps when there's kind of a one-to-one -one correlation between input and, and output. Uh, and by one-to-one, -one, I mean uh, as it parses, it can produce the output pretty much as it goes. Um, obviously, we know that there is one input or one output for every input. We, we just talked about the determinism of parsers. So, um, but the abstract syntax tree is kind of an intermediary uh, stage. It's basically taking the input and turning it into some internal representation. It's not the parser, right? The, the parser you write once and it can uh, handle anything written in that language. The abstract syntax tree is the result of parsing a particular input. So when you're compiling C Sharp or Rust, the compiler first looks at your source code and turns that into an abstract syntax tree. Um, at its simplest level, a, an abstract syntax tree for a, a, a language could be a, a list of statements, an ordered list of statements, right? Uh, in the case of SQL, each statement gets parsed individually. So I, I don't have a concept of, of an ordered list of statements in my, my um, grammar or my AST because basically I, I parse a statement and then I execute that statement and then I don't need that statement anymore. So I throw it away. I don't need to keep track of, of all the statements that have been run. So what that ends up being is it's a tree. Um, and at the top level, you have pr things like program or statement, you know, depending on your language, right? In C Sharp, the top level thing might be program. And then within that, you might have classes and those might be the, the child nodes. Then within that, you have fields and methods. And then within a method, you have uh, statements, uh, some of which might be complex statements. So things like, you know, an, an if statement, and then you have a, a condition, which, in, which is an expression, yet another type of, of, of node. And then you have uh, a block, um, which uh, can then itself be a list of statements and, and so on and so forth. Um, picking your AST for the language is very important because it means that it, it, it is the thing that enables you to do whatever you really want to do with the output of a parser. Most of the time, you're not just writing a parser just to prove that you can parse a language and then print out some, you know, computerized representation of what you just parsed. You want to do something with it. You want to either take that AST and then turn it into uh, bytecode, in the case of Java or C Sharp. C Sharp doesn't call it that intermediate language, uh, you know, the, the compiled representation. Or machine code, in the case of C and C++, uh, I guess technically assembly, if you, if you compile, it, compile it that way. Um, object code. We could, we could get into a, a deep rabbit hole on, on what to call that. Um, or in, in the case of interpreted languages, Python, Perl, that sort of thing, you end up with just the AST, and then you might further optimize that, and then you actually run that. Those interpreters don't run the source code directly. They don't read in a command, perform it. They read in the source file, resolve things, build up this AST and then run, run the AST essentially. So 
the reason that is hard is because it does involve some forward thinking. Um, it's not just as simple as, oh, I parse a thing and obviously I'm going to dump it into an object because, you, you know, that kind of makes sense based on what I'm parsing. You do need to think ahead to how am I actually going to use this? Um, in the case of uh, yesterday's video with where I'm parsing SQL, I had to, it didn't make sense to just parse the SQL and then uh, store everything that I parsed out into some array type you know, it, it could have been whatever. Um, but in the case of a describe table statement, I need to store basically two pieces of information. The fact that it's a describe statement and the table that I'm describing, that's it. Uh, and because of the way Rust works, uh, the fact that it's a describe table statement uh, is the fact that it is a particular value in my statements enum. Uh, so I, I can basically do pattern matching on types and check, is this a describe statement? If it is, you know, match on describe statement and then actually execute the describe statement. And then the name of the table is just a value in that, that struct, that, that enum value, uh, again, the way Rust's enums work, you can you, you can have some of the the members of the enum uh, have values associated with them. So in this case, it's the name of the table. Uh, in the case of the create table uh, enum value that I, I implemented a while back, I didn't do a video on that. Um, but when I did implement that, I needed a few more pieces of information. I needed a table name, and I needed a list of fields and their corresponding definitions. Um, and that's all I stored in the in the uh, the AST. I didn't store the fact that uh, there were parentheses in the statement, or that it, it was create table, or even if you omitted the table. I think that's valid MySQL. I always add it in, so I don't remember. Um, and then similarly with uh, you know select and update, they have their own degrees of complexity, and uh, but I don't need to store everything about the input. I just need to store the parts that are important to how it will execute and, and what will actually execute. Uh, so those are the two things that I, I think are uh, complex when you're writing parsers. The first is the, the complexities in describing the language. And secondly, is the complexity in uh, storing it in some object structure so that you can lose, use it later, specifically the, the abstract syntax tree or AST. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button and that notification bell. And uh, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on parsers. If you've written one, if you're thinking about writing one, um, or if you disagree with anything that I've said here. Thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.